today. I am Sigrid Chalcita, the CEO of April, and I'm joining you from Singapore. Welcome to our investor series, April Opening New Doors for Investments in Asia Pacific. And this uh, series today is actually focusing on investing in Australia. Uh, this is a by invitation event, and this was initiated with the aim of connecting all of our international, our members you know, in the international network through presentations on investment opportunities across the region. Uh, today, you can look forward to gaining a better sense of how to navigate the Australian real estate sector, discover more about the do's and the don'ts of doing business, and where to hunt for best potential returns. Uh, of course, we are cognizant uh, that uh, Sydney just announced a two-week lockdown, and it is estimated that currently around 18 million Australians, or, or around 70% of the population, are under some form of lockdown or coronavirus-related restrictions. Nonetheless, uh, we are very hopeful that some form of recovery or reversal, once the economy is allowed to function more normally, provided, of course, that the coronavirus cases are contained. So with that, I would like to introduce uh, our chairperson or chairman of uh, the Apria Japan chapter, Mr. Hideki Yano, uh, who's also the president and CEO of Sumisho Realty Management Company, uh, just to say a few words and welcome you guys. Over to you, Yano-san. Hi, thank you, Shigeridi. Thank you for a kind of introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Hideki Yano, Japan Chapter Chairman. Early March this year, we hosted a webinar about Xi REIT, China REIT, as an emerging trend in China. This time, we pick Australia as a matured market in APEC region. Australia is one of the most desirable investment destinations for Japanese investors. As you know, it is a very transparent and stable politically and socially investment market supported by a strong fundamental, attracting a long-term core investors. It is one thing. The other thing is securitization platform of assets such as a rate are well advanced and well established, not only in the real estate arena, but also infrastructure arena, which make offshore investor more accessible and easy to invest. As for infrastructure investment, Japan is uh, far behind Australia, unfortunately. Even though Japanese investors are eager to invest in infrastructure sector. So I personally believe Japan need to learn more about the securitization of our infrastructure asset from Australia. Let me touch upon the uh, outline of today's program briefly. Today we share the update of Australia investment market from three different angles. One, property market, second, legal, and third, taxation. We are extremely, extremely fortunate to have uh, such a distinguished speakers for each session. Additionally, I am extremely thankful and grateful for APRIA Australia chapter, my colleague Trevor and his team to make this seminar happen. This kind of cross-border program is something APRIA can offer by collaboration between two chapters crossing the region. So with that, it is my pleasure to get back to Sigrid, please. Thank you very much, uh, Yano san. And indeed, we are very pleased to host this. Uh, this is our first uh, episode on uh, investing in Australia. Uh, I do want to mention to our uh, audience that ha they have an opportunity to raise questions. And feel free to actually type in your question. Uh, and you, know, you can raise them. We will be reading them. I will be reading them. Uh, after each session. So there will be about five minutes uh, Q&A, okay, after each session. So with that, I would like to introduce our speakers uh, for the first session who will be covering uh, the real estate sector in Australia. 
I'm pleased to introduce Mr. Ben Azar, who's National uh, Head, Cross-Border Investments and State Director, uh, Capital Transactions at Savile. Ms. J.C. Lee, who is Associate Director for the Cross-Border Investments, also uh, from Savile's, of course, and, and Mr. Michael Fenton. I don't see Michael yet, but uh, should be joining us, and he's National Head of the Industrial and Logistics and Managing Director. All of you are based in Sydney. So Ben, Jason, Michael, uh, over to you. Thank you, Sigrid. And thank you, Sibri. Thank you, Afria. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is a pleasure to be invited to present today. And as we're limited in time, the Savos presentation will consist mostly on high-level information, but we are happy to expand in further detail um, in, in, next, in other sessions. So the pandemic, in a nutshell, Australia has been handling this pandemic well. The federal and state governments have acted swiftly at the start and we have been mostly COVID safe. Only Melbourne has had prolonged lockdown periods. However, we are seeing clusters across Australia at the moment and resulting in short lockdowns in place. The federal government also responded with over 200 billion of stimulus into the economy with a further stimulus from state governments and bank lending. Over 90 billion of the stimulus was in JobKeeper, which has basically supported wages so that businesses could keep employing staff. A code of conduct was put in place for landlords in regards to rents and essentially stopping evictions, as well as there's been a focus in general for supporting SMEs. We have been extremely lucky. And just until last week, when I was preparing this presentation, I was ready to say life has been normal or normal as can be. Um, social distancing and mask wearing was encouraged, but not mandatory. In fact, the last week was the first time we had to wear masks in the office. So as Sigrid says, said, Sydney is currently under a two week lockdown due to the Delta variant outbreaks. However, um, to put into perspective, the highest daily cases we have seen are about 30 cases. International borders remain closed, which while has been good in protecting Australians from the pandemic, may take its toll on economic growth if prolonged. Vaccine rollout and government policy will be critical for reopening its borders. The total COVID-19 cases are currently around 30,000, only 0.12% of total population. When put into a global perspective, as seen as in this chart, both Australia and Japan have been on the lucky side. Vaccine rollout. Australia has been slower, a bit slower compared to other developed countries, just under a quarter of total population. But this is expected to increase steadily as it rolls out um, further. A quick snapshot of the market. Bond yields have reached all-time lows following major monetary policies to cut interest rates and implement quarantine um, quantity easing programs. This results in an attractive spread between bonds and real estate yields, which we will touch upon later. The cash rate is at 0.1%, which is expected to hold, and we are seeing core debt costs ranging from 140 basis points to 190 basis points all in, which, while it may not seem too impressive to Japanese investors who make up most of their audience today, it is at an all-time low for Australia. The pandemic has led to the first recession in 28 years. Almost all of the fall in GDP was driven by the significant fall of 7% in the June 2020 quarter, which quick recovery in the following quarters. GDP is currently at 1.1% as of March, and um, Australia has actually achieved real GDP growth compared to pre-pandemic levels, securing its status as a safe haven uh, investment market. Stronger than expected economic recovery left the RBA revising the G GDP forecast upwards, expected to grow by 3.5% in 2022 and 3% in 2023. Recovery in employment has also been much faster than previous recessions, despite a more severe, faster initial fall, as you can see in the graph on the right. 
The employment levels fell over 7% in four months from February 2020, with the recovery effectively complete after 12 months. Though there were concerns that the withdrawal of the stimulus measures in the form of JobKeeper in March may cause some reversals, we have not seen evidence of that yet. On the asset classes that are to be seen, um, my colleagues will be talking about office and industrial. So I will only say that both are expecting high demand from investors, both domestic and global, especially core assets with long well and platform acquisition type opportunities. COVID-19 has really sped up many of the trends we've been seeing for a while now, including the rise of online retail, which gives strengths to the logistics sectors, but has impacted the retail market strongly. While this is true in Australia as well, retail is very different here in focus and experiences, as well as regional malls always include groceries and other essential retail, which are trading strong. Hotels are seeing a division where hotels where international travel was the main customer has been impacted and tentatively forecast to recovery to 2019 levels is around 2023. But on the other hand, the pandemic has led to a surge of regional tourism and the regional hotels are booming. Uh, built to rent, while it's still in its early stages here, multifamily or built to rent as it's known in Australia is very topical at the moment and is gaining momentum. Over 20,000 built to rent apartments are planned under construction or complete. And most of the key players are highly ex experienced global players with names that everyone knows and a few domestic groups such as Maribac and Grocon. Given the strength of the education sector, student accommodation is also a sector that continues to attract investment. Whilst the number of international students is almost at standstill due to the border closures, it is expected that once the borders reopen again, recovery will be relatively quick. 2020 alone has seen over 3.1 billion transact. And last, as everywhere in the world, healthcare is gaining a lot of attention. This includes everything from the medical sector, our medical life service, uh, life sciences. And because it is early on, scalability can be a concern for some, but given the strength of the medical research and health system in Australia, both domestic and global capital are turning their eyes in this sector. Again, these are very high level, level comments given the format of today's event, but do feel free to reach out to us for more information. I shall now hand over to Ben Azar for the office segment. Thank you, JC, um, and thank you all for being on the on the um, on the seminar. We'll just touch on some high level um, metrics around the office market, and then fold into some um, to some recent deals and, and and how those deals tracked in the in the Australian market. To really to give you a a coal face um, feel on on office and, and core office in the um, in the Sydney and and or the Sydney CBD. Next slide, JC. Um, so just touching on the leasing market, which is obviously very much um, very much kind of a lot of questions being asked around the leasing market as, as a result of COVID and, and lockdowns. But what we're finding at the coalface of the leasing market is there is a true flight to quality. Um, this theme is consistent after all, all um, recoveries and, um, and, and we're seeing that with, with a lot of um, with a lot of tenants taking advantage of the higher incentive market. And, and moving into to better um, facilities or, or better office space. The small to medium enterprises, um, so the tenants of say up to around 2000 square meters, they are the tenants that are driving the recovery um, as major corporates are yet to really settle on a workplace strategy as a result of, of COVID, more flexible working um, and, and working from home for some part of their businesses. So everyone's really watching um, and waiting to see what, what happens with uh, those major corporates. We don't think it will be hugely material to the market, um, but, but it will have some effect. Um, just, just a comment on occupancy, and, and we get asked a, a lot about occupancy and where Australia currently sits um, you know, during the pandemic with occupancy. And, and this is, a, this is a quite an interesting stat because when we talk about current occupancy levels being at 45% in February 2021, you, you automatically assume that that's coming off 100% base. But um, 
actually pre-pandemic, so 2019, the average, average occupancy across Australia um, was, was sitting around 64%. So, you know, there's really only around 20% to be made up to, to come into, to, sorry, to make up to pre-pandemic occupancy rates. So it's not as, that 45% is not as bad as it might originally seem on the, on the surface. Um, federal and state government um, and other regulatory bodies are really driving to get people back into the office now. Um, and that is really driving this sentiment for, for office space in, in the Sydney CBD. Um, look, our general expectations around vacancies will, it'll, it will start, it will keep edging up. Um, effective rents have, um, are softening um, as incentives have increased as a, as a result of the, uh, the pandemic. Um, but as as um, as the vaccine rolls out, we, we expect that to really expedite and, and there to be a really fast recovery. I think in most of our modelling, um, we're saying maybe next year there will be there will be minimal growth in in the office market. Um, but but then then the next year we're back to normal growth um, in in rent. So um, really, it's kind of just pausing growth for for a matter of twenty four months, and then we expect to be back to normal. Next slide, Jesse. Um, just touching on, on vacancy rates and, and looking at vacancy rates around the country. Obviously, they've all edged up as a result of, of, um, of, of COVID. Um, you can see in the graph there that, I mean, Sydney and Melbourne being the two, the two line graphs at the bottom of the screen, um, sitting at an all-time low of, you know, mid to high 4%. They've edged, they've edged up now to 8% and 7.8% respectively across Sydney and Melbourne CBD. Um, but I mean, what's, yes, they've edged up, but, but what's encouraging, they still are below the 10 year long average. So, um, you know, still sitting at a, at a, at a very good place. Um, Sydney, you know, being a landlocked CBD, um, not a lot of new development on the cards, um, you know, we expect that to stay, stay quite stable and, and, and the um, pressure on rents to, to remain. Um, look, this, this just gives you an effect of, of, of what the incentive market has done to effective rents. Net, net, rent, net face rents or gross face rents, whichever way you want to um, talk about it, they have stayed um, constant. There has not been a decrease in, in, in face rents. Where, where rents have fallen or where landlords have adapted to, the, um, to COVID is, is through the incentive. And so you can see incentives or the net effective rents. So, so rents um, effective of the incentive ha have been increased quite a bit and, and, and more so in, uh, in Sydney rather than other states. Um, mostly because Sydney's been out of Sydney and Melbourne. So Sydney over Melbourne, because Melbourne's been locked down a lot of that time. So there hasn't been a lot of new deals um, realised in, in Melbourne because they've been in, in really a kind of a stalemate where Sydney, obviously we dealt with the pandemic um, a little bit better and we've been business as usual for, for, for quite a long longer time than they have been in lockdown. So, you know, there's been more deal evidence. So you can see the impact that um, that has had on, on net effective rents. Incentives in, in A grade, you know, they, they've jumped from say circa low 20s to um, circa kind of low 30 or, or just above 30% um, percent at the moment. So just some um, some live leasing evidence, which you know, and and all these all these deals do reflect that flight to quality that we're seeing. Um, I won't harp on this too much, but what this demonstrates is that thematic around flight to quality and and ha owning the best in class buildings or those high end buildings. You are you are being less affected by um, the pandemic than say if you own lower grade buildings, B and C grade buildings, we expect those buildings will be the hardest hit by um, the pandemic. Um, but I mean, this will be in your takeaway. I won't walk you through those deals. But what I mean, the whole theme of that is we've had tenants move out of, you know, very good quality buildings, but into new generation, new developments in the majority of these buildings and take uh, increased space. So, I mean, 
this whole pandemic thing of all businesses are shrinking and um, there's no need for office anymore. And, you know, that scaremongering is, is, is just not, not a reality. Um, it's, it's quite the opposite in, in the top end of town in Sydney. Uh, and now flipping to the investment market and, 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 and looking at, I mean, the trends that we're seeing emerging as a result, as we come out of the, the pandemic or, you know, we're still in the, the, the midst of it a, a little bit, but um, I'll touch on some, some recent deals that we've been lucky enough to be involved with later. But ultimately, there is, there's a fight to quality. Um, so tightening of yields for all long leased assets with high occupancy and strong covenants. Um, we've seen that with, with deal flow, but also with, with rounds of valuations. Um, all, all listed guys and um, listed long whale rates have, have experienced serious yield compression. Um, over the last six months, um, as that desire for, you know, for for certainty and for you know um, strong covenant and, and long whale is 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 really is really um, there. Um, Australia's safe haven status ha has increased. Um, global demand is still huge for for Sydney um, and um, international buyers. It's still around a 50, 50, 50 split offshore versus onshore. Looking for you know. Core, core assets in, in Sydney and Melbourne. There has been a scarcity of, of genuine investment opportunities, um, but when, when assets do come on, what it is that create, it's creating a, a very, very competitive marketplace for people to be able to, um, to, to buy core assets. Um, and, and I'll touch on that a little bit later on, on some of our case studies. The low bond and interest rate environment, which JC touched on, um, I think leaves scope for further cap rate compression into the future. Um, and I mean, banks have been quite good in, in managing um, what's happening during the pandemic. So we're yet to really see a lot of distressed assets come to market. Um, we do expect, I mean, there's always after these downturns, it usually takes anywhere from six to 12 months to really see some distress happen. So, I mean, that, that, that will come soon. We think there will be, I don't think it'll be a a bloodbath as such, I think we will we'll see some assets come to market that will be distressed, um, but they will most likely be in the in the lower in lower grade, the, the B and C grade office assets. Um, just I guess this this slide just points it out at our point around yield compression. Um, it is the widest spread we've seen since December 2018 at, at around 300 basis points to the 10 year bond. Um, so, you know, really pointing to long leased, strong covenant new assets um, really have, have a lot of potential for further cap rate compression, especially with the increased demand for that type of investment um, that's coming both, both locally and, and, and offshore. And into the nitty gritty. So, I mean, I'll, I'll touch on these four deals. These four deals are, are the most recent deals done in the Sydney CBD. Um, they are all very much core in nature. Um, I'll start at the top, 200 George Street, um, which we, were, we marketed on behalf of AMP and, and on behalf of their, their wholesale fund. Um, we took that to market at the beginning of this year or earlier in the year. It's currently um, in, ex in exclusive DD position. Um, the price is circa $580 million for the 50% share. Cap rate, we're going to be under 425. So it's around the it's around the 4.15 is, is your core cap rate on, on this asset. Um, campaign was extremely well received. Um, participation um, would have been 80% offshore, 20% onshore. Um, I think as a result, um, I mean, you look at borders being closed, um, that borders being closed had no impact on, on, on this campaign. Um, participation from offshore was extremely, extremely strong. Um, and, you know, a lot of the groups are ahead of the game and, and getting their head around how to transact with cross borders, with with closed borders, um, being you know lending on leaning on 
brokers to be their um, buy side advisors or other professionals to give them comfort around buying without actually inspecting virtual inspections. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a big long list of, of ways people can get their head around purchasing with borders shut. Um, One Bly Street, I'll touch on that. That was another deal we we're involved with marketed um, towards the end of 2020, exchanged in March, 2021. Um, we sold a 33% share on behalf of CBUS um, that was sold to Dexas um, on behalf of Mercatus. Mercatus uh, is, was a new entrant to the Australian market. Um, they'd invested in, in wholesale funds before, but they have not invested in direct property. This was their first foray into the Australian market. Um, they did that obviously with the assistance of Dexas. Um, and ourselves. Um, so, I mean, that, that is a real good test, testament to borders being closed and, and this, this appetite from offshore investment, wanting to get hold of core assets in the Sydney CBD. Um, Governor Philip Tower, another core asset sold in the Sydney CBD, 25% freehold interest. This was done under a preemptive. Um, it wasn't taken to market. It is a, it is, it's probably one of the, the more iconic buildings in the Sydney CBD. Um, there's argument there that they may have got a better price if they did take it to market. Cap rate sat around the 4.5%, um, 27,000 a metre, the 584 million for, um, for that 25% share. So that was sold from GPT with the, with the owners and they sold that to Len Lease, which who were an existing owner uh, in, the, in the trust. Um, Governor Grosvenor Place um, sold, Dexas actually was the vendor, um, sold to CIC. Um, they were existing owner in the, in the trust as well or in the building. Um, that was done late 2020. Um, we're still waiting on FERB approval for that one. So um, that, that one um, where everyone, the whole market's watching on that one. But all in all, FERB's been going very, very, um, very, very well. Um, advice from most lawyers is that FERB is now back to normal. The, the zero threshold has now been lifted um, and timing for FERB is, is back anywhere from six weeks to say two months. Uh, and just touching on, I mean, you look at just more firming up that point we were trying to make regarding this appetite um, for long whale, long whale portfolios. Um, this asset was sold by, by a um, Korean vendor to Charter Hall. Um, it's, it's a mix of assets across, obviously, uh, a big mix of geographies, ACT, New South Wales and Victoria. Um, and I mean, on a blended yield of 5.2%, it, it is a very, very strong result. Um, for a portfolio that, you know, there are some, some very good assets, but there are also some regional assets in that, but it just really shows you that, that demand for annuity style income um, that, that's, that's coming from, from offshore and onshore. But in this case, it was a, an onshore buyer being charter hall. Um, and I'll just throw to Michael Fenton now, just to give you a bit of a, an update on the industrial market. Thanks, Ben. Um, the Australian logistics market has certainly surged in popularity amongst both um, domestic and offshore investors in the past few years. Uh, but this is really, really amplified um, since the onset of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic early last year. Um, the, the best example I could give you of this is um, a transaction of the largest portfolio sale to occur uh, in the Australian logistics market, which was uh, Blackstone's uh, Project Milestone deal, uh, which they sold to ESR with GIC as their capital backer, um, who uh, you know, we also um, interestingly acted as, uh, as buy side advisor for in that deal, which was um, 3.8 billion, uh, as I mentioned, the largest deal ever transacted in the Australian logistics sector, uh, comprising 45 assets across the country, and uh, that deal represented a 4.2% um, cap rate um, with a portfolio whale of six years. So 
um, certainly not a core core asset, but um, sorry, core portfolio, but certainly aggressive pricing. But I think the most remarkable um, aspect of that deal was uh, there were several other bidders um, in that process whose combined offers amounted to about $45 billion in unsatisfied capital. Um, and that's on the, the assumption they were gearing to 50%. So um, there is an abundance of capital chasing fairly limited uh, stock levels, stabilised stock levels in the Australian logistics market. Um, now, the main investment themes that you know grips both domestic and offshore are chasing at the moment threefold, developed to core uh, being a main one, and that's really uh, a pivot due to the lack of available stabilised assets, as I mentioned, to purchase. Uh, so many institutions are now securing their own major land holdings with a view to develop new distribution facilities, um, and I'll touch on that later uh, in this presentation. Um, the other really topical one at the moment, and has really come to the fore certainly since the COVID pandemic, is urban infill and last mile, um, which has grown exponentially in appeal. Um, and that's really on the back of the surge in online retailing. Now, in Australia, we're coming off a fairly low base uh, in terms of online retailing as a percentage of total retail sales. Um, we're only about 10%, um, whereas other more you know, mature markets and certainly up in the Asia-Pacific region, I think Korea is well into the 30s, um, India even is, um, is heading up in that level as well. So we're, we're coming off a fairly low base, but we did grow 118% um, in online retailing during uh, 2020, um, and, uh, and that trend is looking to continue, and hence you know, a lot of investors trying to get on the back of that um, that trend and acquire assets in infill locations that um, are servicing um, that delivery requirement that uh, a lot of Australians are now um, you know, purchasing more online and have expectations of delivery times much shorter than they did in the past. Um, and you can only do that with um, a hub and spoke model where uh, distribution and fulfillment centres are located within core metropolitan markets as opposed what to one distribution centre uh, in each major capital centre. Um, so that's uh, that's a trend they're getting uh, getting on the back of. Um, there have also been numerous corporates taking advantage of current market conditions and record pricing uh, to unlock capital to deploy back into their core business operations uh, by undertaking long-term sale and leaseback programs. Uh, and that's been another major trend in our market here. Uh, groups such as Audi Supermarkets, uh, Arnott's Biscuits and Emergent Cold Storage are some examples of major sale and leaseback programs in the seven, several hundred million dollars each um, that have occurred uh, in the last 12 months alone. Um, now in terms of Occupy demand, this is also uh, at an all time high, really creating a perfect storm uh, in our market. So with um, the shift to online retailing, as I touched on earlier, many groups are re-engineering um, their supply chains and incorporating multiple depots and fulfillment centres in their supply chain networks so they can meet those delivery time expectations of same-day delivery um, that many Australian consumers um, now have. Um, additionally, sorry, JC, if we can um, just go to the uh, next slide. So there additionally have been some advancements in warehouse and logistics automation, um, everything from robot pickers to automated guided vehicles. And this has created this new flight to quality, uh, new purpose-built logistics facilities incorporating latest supply chain technology. So I think as a result, we've seen um, this landscape um, really pivot and consequently there's a very competitive uh, development landscape with institutions who control these major land banks offering very attractive leasing deals. Now, I've highlighted here um, what we've seen on the chart on the right-hand side, how, how rents have really spiked um, in the last few years, although they have started to plateau out in recent times. That's a consequence of uh, new land supply coming online, um, which is uh, meeting demand, but that's, that supply is, is keeping um, uh, keeping that, that growth uh, fairly stymied with rents as we move forward. 
And on the left-hand side, we've seen um, this is average prime yields on the east coast of Australia, so the Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane markets. So this incorporates both core and secondary yields blended. Um, but if uh, I was to give you an example of where core product now sits in the market on the back of some transactions, we're back um, below 4% at about 3.6, 3.7%, um, which is certainly an unprecedented level. Um, so, you know, that impact of both, you know, capital and occupied demand at the same time has, has resulted in that um, significant compression in yields and that spike in rents, which is, uh, you know, delivering huge value growth to, to industrial investors. Uh, JC, if we can just click over. So here are some of those uh, major recent investment transactions that I mentioned uh, that we've been involved with at, um, at Savile. So the $3.8 billion Blackstone portfolio, that traded at 4.2%. Uh, the PFD Foods portfolio that we represented Charter Hall in, uh, 269.4 million. Again, that was in the low fours on a 10-year uh, sale and leaseback of 20 assets around the country. Um, and at the opposite end of the spectrum, um, value add portfolio owned by Capital Land um, that we sold um, to Arrow um, uh, Capital Partners um, at a rate in the mid 5% uh, level for a ticket price of $101.6 million. Um, JC, next slide. I mentioned um, the, the pivot towards um, uh, or the flight to quality of occupiers with, uh, you know, reinvigorating their supply chains, moving to um, incorporate automation, uh, both in their uh, warehouse management systems and supply chains, uh, investing quite heavily um, in uh, automated uh, guided vehicles, uh, robotics, um, self-picking um, and the like. And um, a lot of that has been driven by our major retailers, such as Woolworths, Coles, I mentioned Audi and Metcash, uh, but most notably Amazon um, entered the market here in Australia a few years ago. Um, they're currently constructing their first purpose-built distribution centre uh, in Western Sydney. It, it's an amazing um, uh, uh, four-level uh, distribution centre, fully automated, over 191,000 square metres um, at a rate that hasn't been disclosed, um, but that's being done by Goodman um, on a 20-year lease um, to Amazon, and that um, is cascading down in terms of what um, groups are now looking to achieve in terms of the investment they're making um, in their supply chain and all the groups beneath that, um, in Woolworths, then uh, third-party logistics providers such as DHL, UPS and Simon Carriers are all moving to brand new facilities, um, whereas the investment that's going on in terms of their materials handling system and inventory management systems are more often than not more valuable than the, uh, the warehouse shelves themselves. Um, JC, if we can just go over. So what's um, this doing to vacancy rates um, in the Australian market? Well, it's very topical at the moment because we are hitting record low vacancy levels in all the major markets. Um, this chart here just shows uh, what's happening across the board in the various size cohorts um, in the major East Coast markets uh, of, uh, of Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane. Um, and you can just see from that, I, I can, as, an, as an overall average, we're getting uh, to just over 2%. Um, but, um, you know, to have... Um, 30,000 square metre plus buildings at a vacancy of less than uh, less than 2% is um, is unprecedented in the market here. Uh, if we go into more detail on each of the markets, Jace, if we go over to the next slide. So the Melbourne vacancy rate. Now, Melbourne um, is the largest uh, market uh, in Australia by size and by built form, um, where the vacancy rate has really plummeted now to 1.55%. Uh, as an average, um, uh, coming down from 2.5% um, for the same period six months ago. So uh, again, that is um, that's a record that we've never seen before, um, and um, uh, looks like Melbourne's uh, uh, 
previous issues of land supply and an abundance of land supply have not impacted uh, the market to the extent that everyone expected. Next slide, thanks, JC. Uh, Sydney's vacancy rate also halved to an average uh, over all the various size, so size cohorts to just 1.4% um, over the last six months to the end of these figures are until the end of March. We, uh, we're literally finalising our June quarter numbers as we speak. Um, but yeah, this is a consequence of rising online retail sales and increased stockpiling by companies as they're battling the supply chain squeeze, which has uh, uh, been a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and uh, as you can imagine, Australia is a net importer of most products and globally supply chains have come under uh, a lot of stress. So um, to deal with um, overcoming the issue of um, back orders building up, um, there is a lot of stockpiling going on um, across all of our FM, FMCG uh, product lines in Australia. Next one, thanks, JC. And, and Brisbane also reflects a similar story um, to uh, to Sydney and Melbourne. Um, the the biggest issue uh, for them in in terms of vacancy is in that size cohort between three and ten thousand square metres. That's a consequence of uh, a lot of consolidation going on in that market between uh, mergers and takeovers and and uh, and businesses growing and taking larger facilities and leaving behind um, vacant, older, generally older style assets in that size size range between three and 10,000 square metres, which is um, the biggest vacancy um, exposure in, in any size in any market um, in the country. Next one, thanks, JC. Now I mentioned uh, the supply of land earlier in my presentation and Melbourne um, has traditionally had the biggest land supplies. They're broken up into three major markets, the West, um, um, which is the major logistics hub, on the left-hand side, the North, which is um, the, um, the markets around Tullamarine Airport, the major airport um, in Melbourne, and uh, the Southeast, which is where the, uh, the high-tech R&D precincts um, are generally located, along with uh, some distribution centres. Now, the interesting thing is that um, you know, total vacant land um, that's controlled by institutions now um, is only a small percentage of the market as a lot of it has already been um, developed out um, and, and new land uh, is still a number of years away from coming online. So as a consequence, we're seeing, um, we're seeing um, rental rates, uh, face rents still hold up, uh, incentive levels um, um, to meet to meet uh, this demand have uh, have risen from somewhere around eight to ten percent in this market to up to, to over twenty, and so in some cases the high twenties. Um, if we just go to the next slide, JC, the same has been reflected um, in the Sydney market where we've got new land supply coming online. Um, these are the four major markets in Sydney's west, uh, the central west, which is very uh, land constrained now, fully developed out. Um, lots of uh, competing uses, change of zoning from industrial to, to mixed use and residential. Uh, the southwest, where the major uh, new intermodal is going. Um, the northwest, uh, which is again land constrained, but the main one on the bottom left there is uh, the outer west, or just known as Sydney West. Um, that land release um, comprises an, an additional thousand hectares of land that is now. Um, in the process of being rezoned and now serviced, which is controlled by institutions. Um, that precinct sits around the new uh, Sydney Second Airport, which is currently under construction um, and due to be operational in about four years time. Um, but that land release is going to keep uh, land, uh, sorry, keep rents, um, certainly net effective rents, uh, fairly suppressed over the next few years. So. To give you an example, um, Sydney's always had um, cheaper incentive levels than than, um, than Melbourne, and, and Ben mentioned it's the same the same sort of structuring of incentives in the commercial market. They're offered as generally a period of rent free, um, and um, for the first time ever, we've seen that um, hit into the high high twenty percent mark in the Sydney in the Sydney market. Um, and if we go to Brisbane, next slide, thanks, Tracy. Um, 
yeah, we're seeing the two major markets there, the north where, where it's fairly land constrained and also the trade coast of the two main markets, um, very tightly held. Unlike Sydney and Melbourne, uh, Brisbane isn't as dominated by institutions, uh, more privately held and uh, by, by investors and boutique funds um, and not traded as frequently um, and generally uh, much less development land. So uh, incentive levels in those markets are certainly below 20% in most cases. Um, and we can just see there on that chart on the right-hand side as a comparison where the majority of um, of land supply sits um, as a percentage of uh, the total total supply in those markets. And as you can see, that land on the back of the new Sydney Second Airport and all the land being rezoned and released around that uh, around that precinct is the market that's going to cause um, the highest amount of supply going forward over the next few years. And therefore, uh, we see rents tapering off in that market, certainly compared to the other major markets in Australia and certainly the East Coast. So while the market, um, the logistics market is very hot at the moment and has been for the last few years, where where is the slowdown going to come from? Well, I think aside from you know, an increase in interest rates, which uh, according to most economic commentators and the Reserve Bank of Australia itself isn't expected until 2023, uh, it is going to be on this, um, this factor of new land supply. Um, and as this land continues to be brought online, um, for the um, in, in these uh, in these new rezoned hubs, uh, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne, we will have um, land values come backwards, which will have a flow on effect to rents um, and also potentially cap rates. Um, so that is the section on the uh, the industrial sector. I'll pass back to you, JC. Thank you, um, Sigrid. I'll hand back to you because I do believe we've gone over the time a bit. All right, okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, JC, Michael, and Dan. Uh, I just want to inform the audience that, uh, especially our Japanese audience, that our program will end at 4.30 p.m. your time, okay? So uh, we do have uh, enough time for the two sessions, okay? Uh, uh, for the next one, um, we, I, I'm pleased to introduce uh, George Rolfe, who's Executive Director of Property at Plenary Group, Mr. Wissam Abri, who's partner at Minter Ellison. Uh, both George and Wissam, by the way, are uh, members of our Australia Chapter Board, and at the same time are very active members of the APRIA Regional Advocacy Committee. Uh, one of the things that they do, they do for us is make sure they you know, actively help in all of our advocacy campaigns that will actually uh, facilitate cross-border activities. So we're privileged to have them give us an update on the legal side. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn these over to both George and Bissam. Thank you, Sigrid. Um, and thank you to all of you who have joined us um, today. George and I will be covering um, both legal and commercial, uh, give a, a, a slight legal and commercial overview about investment in real estate in Australia. I will just open up or share the relevant presentation with you all. Okay. So, um, as was mentioned, uh, I think has been mentioned earlier, um, Investment in real estate has been strong for some time. Um, you only need to look at FERB's annual report over the last five years to see how much foreign investment is moving into the real estate sector. It's a constantly growing sector. It's usually number one or number two sector in Australia when it comes to foreign investment. So it's obviously quite um, attractive regardless of which region of the world that you're coming from. The what, what we intend to do, hopefully today, George and I, um, is give you a very high-level overview about when you what to consider from a legal perspective and to some degree from a commercial perspective um, when investing in real estate. And there are various things to consider, um, and we've set out some of those in the agenda, like the structuring, uh, the foreign investment approval, um, 
getting the economic and commercial objectives laid out at the very beginning so that the deal can be structured to meet those objectives and strategy. And a lot of the times that involves, um, if it's a first time entry in Australia, but sometimes even if, you've, if you're coming into Australia you know, numerous times, it does mean partnering up with a local, someone who's got the capability on the ground who you wish to, to partner up with. And so there are various sort of considerations in putting in place those joint ventures and those capital partnerships. And um, you will find in Australia um, development, um, the development play is, 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 is very important. Um, funding developments through fund through arrangements and forward sales is increasingly becoming a very important part uh, in participating in investment uh, in both real estate and infrastructure. So hopefully over the, the, the course of our you know, call 15 to 20 minute presentation, we'll be able to, to cover all those points. Okay, so preliminary consideration. When, when investing in real estate, um, it always helps, and you know this is where a sort of a, a term sheet gets prepared. But to lay out from the very beginning, what are the what are the obstacles that need to be overcome to make this work for you? And to make it work, um, there's obviously a structuring element to it. And I'll speak to some legal structuring, but increasingly the legal structuring is very connected with tax and with duty. But I'll leave it to my tax and uh, colleagues to comment on tax and duty later on, but I just want to make the point at this stage. Whenever you're first investing in Australia, one of the first things you need to do is, is to think about tax and how tax is relevant um, to legal structures. The, the second thing to think about very early on is um, commercially what your objectives are, what you're after, and we've had the Savills team you know, talk about um, various uh, um, assets, their performance, uh, some macroeconomics uh, in relation to Australia and various sort of segments within, within, within this country. And a lot of that is going to feature into this part in terms of working out what your objectives and your strategies are. Um, and I'll speak in a little bit more detail later on, but that's going to be, you know, whether your, um, your entry into Australia is a long-term investment, a short-term investment, whether you're after yield, whether you're after development profit, whether you're after exposure to a particular class of asset, a particular state within the country. Um, various investors have various different objectives and, and trying to map those out is obviously very important. Um, things like cap rates, IRR, all those things generally feature when trying to understand and, 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 and put together the objectives. Um, the at some at some point, um, some of these objectives evolve beyond the financial, and and we have investors that decide to initially come into Australia not only to have financial exposure to to real estate assets, but eventually to get familiar with the market and eventually build a, a, a potentially a platform in the country um, and build a little bit of a capability within the country. So. Again, objective strategy, it is really driven by what the, in, the uh, foreign investor is particular after. Also on structuring and strategy, um, they're sort of connected, but really um, around sort of the level of equity, the level of debt um, that will be used uh, within the investment. I mentioned tax earlier. Tax is probably going to feature here as well in terms of trying to get the optimum levels uh, of equity and debt, not only from an economic perspective, because um, there's a sort of an optimum uh, LVR um, that you would be able to calculate, but also from a tax perspective, there are certain rules uh, and, and requirements in relation to how much debt uh, you're able to have within the structure. Um, and then the, the, the final piece on this slide, you know, right at the beginning is, is in addition to getting your tax right, the other thing is, is getting the other regulatory aspects uh, in place. Uh, it, all, it almost always means you will need FERB. Um, I will touch on that a little bit later. But depending on the type of investment, how you're making it, what your objectives are, et cetera, et cetera, it may end up meaning having to consider licensing, uh, financial services licensing and, and registration 
of, uh, of what we call managed investment schemes um, for effectively vest investments in funds in Australia that ultimately hold the real estate assets. So that these are sort of the initial things uh, to consider at the very outset before uh, formalising any, any legal documentation. Moving on to the next slide. Okay, so of those three, I mentioned structure. Um, so on this slide, it's a very simple sl slide. It's just giving you an example of what a structure could look like. The structure is, is, is uh, in some way sort of agnostic to whether the vehicle is a trust or a company or a partnership. Um, generally speaking, in Australia, most um, real estate investment is, is carried out or under, undertaken through a, a trust structure, uh, which is a, a sort of a, a unique type of structure that is used commonly in Australia in real estate. And there's a, there is a complexity to it because there's a separation between legal ownership and benefic beneficial ownership and effectively the beneficial owners or the unit the unit holders or the holders of the units are are ultimately the owners of the underlying asset whereas the trustee or the or the legal owner of the asset is the one that generally manages the asset so legal tied to legal ownership is uh, generally management and control and tied to beneficial ownership is um, let's call it economic ownership and the economic uh, uh, benefits that come out of the asset. So in a structure like this, um, you know, a lot of the times when investors are coming in, I've got right at the top, the investor generally partners up with a local, which I've called here the manager, um, someone who's got the capability. And so you've got the investor joint venturing with uh, local capability through a head vehicle and then setting up sub vehicles that sit underneath the head vehicle in order to acquire either a portfolio of assets or it might be just you know single assets being acquired gradually over a period of time um, and then the the manager who's got the capability um, Will be, would generally provide things like investment management services, property management services, development management services, depending on the on the type of asset and depending on the specific requirements of the investor and what type of services they would want from their local partner. But um, I might uh, just sort of summarise this slide by just, by just saying that ultimately, like we said, structure is fairly standard and straightforward in Australia. It's generally the trust structure. It's used in almost all structures and it's um, to some degree akin to the GP LP relationship. We've just got to, we just call it sort of the manager slash trustee uh, uh, acts as the GP and the LP are usually the unit holders in the trust. Moving on to the next slide. So that was structure. Um, uh, on the regulatory piece, um, I, I mentioned FERB and licensing, but I probably would want to spend a bit more time on FERB or, or what we would call foreign investment uh, approval. Um, so not surprisingly, investment in real estate, much like investment in, in, in most things in Australia, where there is a foreign person involved, uh, involved then it requires FERB approval. Um, there are various complicated rules around how that works, but fortunately for, for real estate, it's a, it's a little bit more straightforward than other sectors in Australia. The real estate sector is usually uh, more straightforward. What we've got in there is um, some thresholds um, around who requires FERB approval when wanting to invest in Australia. We've, we've put in, I mean, on this particular slide, we focused on real estate investment as opposed to other types of investment in Australian businesses. And you can see the various thresholds. Um, these thresholds are, are, are pretty much the same or very similar to what they were before COVID. So we've, we've, we've gone back to the, the situation that we were in before COVID. Um, and you can see, obviously, if you're a foreign government investor, 
then there's a there's a nil threshold. So you um, you have to lodge the application. If you're a private foreign person, then depending on the type of asset and the size of the asset, you may or may not need FERB approval. I should say in terms of um, process, um, you know, 99% of FERB applications are approved when it comes to real estate. Um, it's a very, very safe asset class to be investing in. Um, and I've never come across um, an application that has not been approved in the real estate sector. And we've dealt with, with plenty of them over the years. Um, if there is certain land that's a bit sensitive, might take a bit more time or a bit more attention um, by the by by FERB. And what we mean by sensitive land, for example, if the if the property has um, uh, Australian defence as 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 a tenant, or you're sitting next to a military facility, then land like that is is going to naturally grab more attention. Um, ultimately. The process uh, for FERB is is quite smooth these days. There was a, you know, it, it, it was a bit more difficult last year. This year, I think it was mentioned earlier by Savills, but this year we've gone uh, back to pre-COVID levels. So FERB generally takes about call it six to eight weeks for straightforward real estate transactions. Um, the more complicated transaction is, it might you know it might add a, a few more weeks on top of that. But, but generally speaking, we'd say six to eight weeks, and and there are fees payable, but then the fees are largely um, depend depend on the size of the transaction. So there's a sliding scale. I won't. There's a lot of details, so I won't go into the, the detail on this call. But there is a sliding scale where you know that might start from six thousand dollars to thirteen thousand dollars, and then it, you know it may grow to to something like a hundred thousand dollars, depending on whether you're coming in. On a twenty million dollar transaction, all the way to something like a you know three billion dollar transaction. Um, they're the things to consider, I guess, with with uh, with foreign investment approval is process, which is fairly smooth, fees, um, and the thresholds. But from an, in terms of approval, uh, it's almost always approved. Okay, moving to the next slide. Um, but I mentioned at the beginning in terms of preliminary, it was structuring, it was regulatory, and, and then the, the, the third category was around objectives and strategy. And um, Savills touched on uh, a bit of this uh, uh, um, earlier in the, in the presentation, but it really does depend on what you're after. Um, you know, what we've increasingly been seeing over the last seven years is Obviously, with the compression of cap rates, we're, we're watching our clients now looking for value, um, not just in core office and core retail, which used to be the hotspots seven years ago, but now are looking at sort of alternative uh, sources of real estate. So um, that could be anything like um, healthcare, student accommodation, built to rent, and, and importantly, development assets. So um, a lot of value is created by participating in development. And so we're seeing a lot more and more uh, investors coming into the country in order to participate um, in that development from the very outset. And there are tax advantages, and, and George will probably touch on some of those when he speaks about fund through um, arrangements. Um, deals are becoming, uh, because of the saturation of capital, um, on the on the opportunities that are available, it does mean that deals are starting to become more structured, more complicated. Um, so you know there really needs to be sort of and, and a lot of more, a lot more partnering up. Um, so uh, a lot of the foreign investors are partnering up with with locals in order to um, pursue particular opportunities. And you know we see that across the board. And I think Project Milestone was was mentioned earlier and. We were acting for one of the unfortunately unsuccessful bidders on that massive portfolio, but that pursuit was largely done. But whether it be the successful bidder or unsuccessful bidders, um, is always done not just one stakeholder, but there's usually a number of stakeholders that that uh, join together in order to pursue the opportunity. Um, but what we've got on this 
screen is just, again, just examples of things to consider, things to tell the lawyer, because once we understand what your, you know, what, what your economic objectives are, it leads us to the next slide, um, which is we start to think about um, things like the governance regime, distribution regimes, funding regimes, your exit strategy. And so the legal architecture, and I won't go into detail on this particular slide, but only just to highlight that the legal infrastructure is ultimately driven by the commercial objectives. Um, whether you're a long-term investor, short-term investor, development play, yield play, um, et cetera, et cetera, whether you want to be passive, whether you want to be active, all those things will ultimately have an impact on the legal documentation that we put in place. Um, so what I've got on this particular slide is just it, um, what I would call sort of the key considerations in particular if you're investing in this country and you're in some way joint venturing, whether it's a formal joint venture or some other arrangement where you've got a relationship with someone else um, that isn't a strict or formal joint venture, but something similar to it, regardless, when you're partnering up with someone else in investing in Australia, then these are the, the, the kinds of things that you need to be um, thinking about and making sure that you get right. I will uh, move on to the next slide. And I think, George. Uh, Thanks, Rizam. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk through fund through and forward sale transactions and, and coming from a, a developer's perspective. So these are um, alternative ways to get into the market you know, than a traditional purchasing and building. Um, they're practical and effective for both a developer and an incoming capital partner. Firstly, they provide the developer with um, security of capital. So rather than go to the market for, for mezzanine or construction finance, um, the incoming investor provides that finance. And secondly, they provide that investor you know, access early to high quality and um, new product being delivered by the developer and um, at the start of the uh, commencement of a lease. So you gain a often high quality and secure long while income. So who does what in this transaction? Um, the capital partner investor provides that construction finance to the developer. And in exchange, um, they get early transfer of the land. Um, and I'll talk about the benefits of that in a moment. The legal instrument between the two parties, the capital investor provides the developer a development agreement. Um, that covers key items such as design approvals, key design approvals, the leasing criteria for the, um, for the income, as well as uh, when the developer still requires landowner's consent or the capital partner's consent. The developer continues to take on um, most of the development risk, so any residual planning um, approvals that are required, uh, controlling the construction delivery, so managing the construction process, and then is responsible for leasing. Um, the developer will pay, obviously, the capital partner or the investor a coupon. That coupon, think of it as an, um, an interest rate. So it's interest on the money that are loaned to the developer, and it's equivalent to the cap rate or the capitalization rate that the capital partner is paying for the end product. Thanks, Wissam. So some of the advantages um, for doing this alternative style transaction, firstly, increase the depreciation costs. So you're acquiring an asset early, you're getting early access to depreciation on that plant and equipment you're acquiring. And secondly, most importantly, is the stamp duty savings. Um, stamp duty is only paid on the entry price, which is typically the land value. So you're only paying the stamp duty tax on the land value rather than the end value of the asset. A couple of important considerations, particularly around office, um, to get your head around for a first time investor is, is the, the leasing criteria that's in the development agreement. Firstly, need to agree with the developer a rental guarantee. So this is securitizing the income um, post completion for a set period of time. It's typically between two to five years of a rental guarantee provided by the developer for any unlet space in the building. 
Um, also need to understand that the, the market for the larger agreement for leases and, and general lease provisions. So key items such as um, the fit out contributions, um, the rent free periods, any lease tails for uh, new tenants, as well as general make good um, and rent reviews. So a lot of those key criteria are agreed within ranges with the developer under the development agreement. And uh, finally there, the bank guarantee provisions that you are willing to accept for your, for your tenants. And they would range from larger tenants for 12 months down to very small tenants uh, on smaller rents for a period of zero months. Thanks, Wissam. Um, so just going quickly conscious of time here, but recently or well, since 2017, these style of transactions um, have accounted for over 20 new buildings. I suspect it's more than that um, in the date of this slide, around $6.8 billion of investment in, in offices in particular, over 500,000 square meters of space. And really um, we see this trend continuing as mentioned by Savills, the scarcity of, of genuine investment product that's available, um, capital partners and investors looking for opportunities to get in early, um, sometimes off market, um, to purchase new product with that long income stream. I've just got a couple of examples on the next slide. Um, thanks, Wissam. So um, the building on the left, 275 George Street in the heart of the Sydney CBD was actually purchased by Daiburu, which I'm sure a lot of people on this call um, will know those guys. That was a forward, a fund through, um, and it was uh, purchased at around a 4.5% cap rate. So the developer paid that 4%, 4.5% um, coupon all the way through from the first investment to completion at the end of last year. And there was a, a five-year rental guarantee provided by the developer. The second building in the middle is called the Glass House in Macquarie Park. So Sydney's second largest commercial office market. That was forward sold six months from completion uh, by the developer to Charter Hall with a two-year rental guarantee. It was completed earlier this year. Or, yeah. And then finally, um, Waterloo Metro Quarter. So that's the integrated station development as part of the new Sydney Metro. Uh, it's a large mixed use development, but there was a student accommodation building forward sold by the developer to Igloo. Um, and Igloo is a local student accommodation operator, but they're backed by GIC, um, obviously Sovereign Wealth Fund from Singapore. So that was purchased for 165 million. That building is not completing until mid 2024. So, um, yeah, that is the end of the presentation, but, but forward sales and fund throughs um, across office, across build to rent, multifamily, student and, um, and hotels are quite common in our market. Thanks, Sigrid. Thank you, George. And thank you, Wissam. You know, in the interest of time, I know we got a few questions here, but we will just be fielding them, okay, post the webinar. Uh, so with that, uh, I would just like to introduce our speakers for the third session. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Simon Clark, uh, who is Strategic Advisor at KPMG Australia. And he will also be joined by David Lewis, who is Head of Transaction Advisory Tax Group, uh, who's based in Tokyo. Um, Simon is also a member of our uh, APRIA chapter or board, and at the same time, a very active member of our regional advocacy team. He is an expert in taxation, so uh, we are pleased to have both Simon and, and David uh, join us. Uh, over to you, uh, Simon and David. Thank you, Sigrid, and um, apologies you. to the audience and to the interpreters. We are running massively behind time, so I'm going to change this around a little bit and I hope that um, what I do with it makes sense. Could I have the slides up please? Thank you. Let's just go straight to slide two. We don't need the cover slide. Can we, uh, is that going to be share screen? Thank you. So um, let's in the interest of time, stick to the key issues in Australia. And in Australia, um, we are quite a high tax country, probably not so much when you compare us to Japan to some other countries in the world, but we, 
We do have a corporate headline rain of 30%. And we also have a very, very active tax office who audits extensively and is quite aggressive in their outlook. So structures in Australia have to be very defensible and generally very conservative in their outlook. When it comes to property, there are broadly two categories of investment. There is development activity. And if you are developing with a view to sell, then broadly you should be expecting that you're going to pay the corporate tax rate. Uh, there is the ability to use leverage in Australia, but that is capped by thin cap rules and capitalization rules to around 70% of the value. So uh, we don't have a lot of flexibility around those sort of transactions in Australia. We do also have both revenue and capital gains tax outcomes that apply on the disposal of assets. Uh, there isn't a clear distinction between revenue and capital gains in Australia. It's a facts and circumstances analysis, but in Australia, the tax rate for foreign investors on capital gains and revenue assets is effectively the same. It will still be 30%. The more interesting case um, is when you are either buying into a holding structure or you are developing to hold. In both of those situations, Australia provides some beneficial tax outcomes if you can fit yourself into our Managed Investment Trust or the acronym MIT regime, which um, is a trust structure. It can only be a trust structure at the moment, although there is talk about Australia moving towards a CCIV regime, which will allow equivalent limited partnership and corporate structures with a lower rate of tax. But the main benefit of being in the MIT regime is the ability to access a 15% tax rate, one five, half of our corporate tax rate. So very beneficial when people could get into it, but it comes with a uh, large list of um, criteria which need to be satisfied, which are included in the paper, but uh, we'll see if we get to them today. But I think one of the things that I, I perhaps might throw to David to comment on is it's all well and good if we get a, an MIT outcome in Australia and therefore potentially get a 15% tax rate. But it's really essential how that investment is treated in Japan and particularly how your CFC regime might apply to that MIT structure. So David, I might just get you to spend a couple of minutes walking through some of the issues that arise in sure. that regard. Thank you, Simon. And thank you everybody for your time today. Um, yes, when we're looking at MIT structures, from a Japanese perspective, um, the first thing as Simon mentioned um, is, um, are we falling within the um, CFC or the tax haven uh, rules, um, which we need to um, manage from a Japanese perspective? Essentially, if Japanese investors are less than 50% of the investment in the vehicle, we should um, be okay. But then the next point, which is actually very important, and it's partly a legal question as well as a tax question, is how is the trust treated for Japanese tax purposes? Um, and once again, that will depend on the exact um, structure that we put in place. But if the trust um, is treated as a certain type of trust and we structure it correctly, then it should be possible to avoid double taxation um, so that when the distributions from the MIT are subject to 15% tax in Australia, we get a credit for that 15% in Japan um, and we don't suffer double tax. However, if it is structured incorrectly, then what's going to happen is we will pay the 15% tax in Australia. We will not get a credit for it in Japan, and then we will have to pay um, the headline corporate tax rate on that income again. So obviously that's a very bad outcome. And I think as Simon mentioned, the key point when we are doing these structures is to make sure that one, we get a very good Australian outcome, but it's also critical that we get 
the best Japanese outcome um, for you and um, for your investment. So it does require making sure we manage both sides of um, the ocean um, on our investments. Thank I you, David. Go into more detail then. Thanks, Simon. No, no, I don't. I, I think the the important thing for me is when I look at an MIT structure, its qualification in Japan becomes really important. And that definition of securities investment trust and whether it fits into it is a critical outcome right. to actually getting an overall effective outcome. So um, it, it's, it's um, uh, the Australian outcome might be great, but if it doesn't work in Japan, um, it uh, rebounds and ends up um, with double tax, as David said. So it's a critical structuring issue, obviously, to, to manage both sides of the ocean. So look, in the interest of time, I'm going to flick through the remaining slides fairly quickly and just give you a, an introduction to what the slides are about. I might make a couple of comments as we go. What we've got there is just um, some quick, simple diagrams of the different structures. Corporate structure, as I said, is, is normally the development uh, buy to sell type outcome. Most people would not want to use it if they are looking to be a long-term investor. Their unit trust structure and a managed investment trust structure, they are essentially both unit trust structures. It's just that the managed investment trust is a unit trust that has met all of the requirements to get the concessional rate. Uh, I won't spend any time at all on stapled investment structures, but essentially we have a number of those which are particularly used in the infrastructure space where you need to combine a business with a passive investment of real estate. And if you need to do that in Australia, you would normally split it into two and have two um, investment structures, which are the same investors and they are what we call stapled, which means that the shares and the units are contractually traded together. So that business can track each other. So keeping going through the slides quickly, if we can just go to the next one. I won't spend any time on that at all, but what we did in this table was just do a summary of the different tax outcomes for each of those diagrams on the previous page. So uh, if you have time and the interest, you can sit down there and work through all of the different tax outcomes for each of those four structures and see what the differences are. Uh, it will become apparent very quickly that where you can, you want to be in the MIT world. So keeping going. Um, the life cycle would not be, for anybody who invests in real estate regularly, would not be a surprise to any of you, and I won't spend any time on it here. You obviously have to manage acquisition issues. As with Sam and George both mentioned, in Australia, we have a federal and a state system. At the state level, there are stamp duties, which are payable on acquisition of real estate or shares in a company that owns real estate or trusted owns real estate. And therefore, as George says, if you're in the development cycle, you tend to want to buy the asset as early as you can in the development phase so that you get the lowest possible value for stamp duty in the land. Holding period um, would be something that, and then the disposal and the structuring that we do needs to take a care account of all of those um, various elements. So um, move it, and the, the life cycle of a unit trust, whilst it's a little bit different, there's really no different to those that you would apply in any investment structure and you do anywhere in the world. David, feel, feel free to interrupt me if there's any Japan specific issues that need to be overlaid yeah. in what I'm saying. Thanks, Simon, that's fine. I'm going very quickly in the interest of, well, trying to finish close to time. I mentioned thin capitalization already. I think most people uh, who are investing globally would be used to the fact that there are limitations on interest. Um, we have those in Australia, they're not going away. They're likely to get tighter over time. Um, they normally have to be signed off as part of your FERB um, outcomes, which is the Foreign Investment Review Board proposed, uh, process that with Sam, um, referred to a lot of those firm applications, uh, which is essentially a legal process, now get reviewed and signed off by the tax office. And you have to provide details of how you're going to structure it for the tax office. And if the tax office doesn't like it, 
it's possible that you'll be asked to reassess your FERB application. So essentially, you need a tax sign off to invest in Australia in substance. Keeping going, um, again, in the interest of time, there's some um, withholding tax rates there for the different levels of funding you might do. Um, I won't go through those again, given where we're at in time. I want to try and get to the MIT stuff for the last five minutes, so let's keep going. Um, so the MIT requirements. Um, this is the critical thing that, that uh, needs to be satisfied to get MIT. What we tend to find is because they are so complex, um, people who invest in Australia for the first time normally invest with a, an Australian partner or into an Australian capital partnership for uh, which is capable of, fee, of satisfying the MIT requirements because most Japanese investors, unless they are a sovereign wealth fund or themselves are widely held REIT or another widely held vehicle will not of themselves satisfy the requirements of the MIT. So a listed company, a private company, a family office, or none of those vehicles will of themselves be able to qualify for MIT. So we typically find, particularly in the early days, that people will co-invest with an, a local fund. We have plenty, which were mentioned in the various transactions that have been spoken about today, but uh, Dexas, GPT, Westfield, we have a whole bunch of people who are both A REITs and uh, fund managers. But also we find people co-invest with the sovereigns. George mentioned GIC several times. GIC, because it's a sovereign, is a naturally natural entrant into our MIT rules. So foreigners actually invest with those uh, offshore investors who are also qualified for MIT. Um, we really are up against the clock, so I don't really have time to go through those requirements today. I think David and I are looking at the option of, of uh, speaking to some people more directly about some of these, so we might do it uh, at a later date. But as I said, the key benefit of getting into MIT is you get half of the corporate tax rate, not just on your income, but also on the underlying capital gains. So it is a massive benefit to be into that. And we have a lot of people who, who um, have it as a precondition almost to investment in Australia. Um, I think that's about all I'm going to say, given where we are. David, any questions or thoughts about what I'm saying in terms of that? No, I think that's fine. The, the one point I would mention just for everybody, obviously, if we are holding real estate and yeah, through a corporate structure, um, we can potentially get the dividend received uh, deduction um, in Japan, so we would suffer minimal tax um, on distributions back out um, from Australia. So given that Australia and Japan have similar um, tax rates, it, it probably would not um, be too bad an outcome, but obviously, you know, as Simon mentioned, clearly the MIT structure, um, if we can make it work, um, is uh, the, the best structure for um, investors coming from Japan. Thank you, David. Um, the last slide there just has the stamp duty rates, which as I said, are based on a state level. They're also very, um, carefully monitored <laughs> and um, there used to be a big industry in stamp duty avoidance but nowadays I think in most large commercial transactions people just treat it as a cost of acquiring an asset. There's very little of activity around stamp duty avoidance in Australia nowadays. Um, I think we'll finish there. Uh, it's the last slide anyway so Sigrid, we did that incredibly quickly, given that tax is a very complicated topic. I apologize for being so quick about it, but I thought it was important to try and finish on time. No worries, uh, Simon. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Simon, David, George, Sam, Michael, Ben, and JC. Uh, we, we did cover a lot of content and we will look at having another round of uh, this uh, to make sure that we are able to uh, cover this in detail. I would also like to thank our chapter chairman, um, 
Hideki Yano uh, for graciously helping us also put this together, this program, and our friends uh, in Aries, Japan, arigato gozaimasu. Uh, all presentations and takeaways, uh, as well as the recordings of the webinar will be available uh, next week. We will make sure to have uh, the all of this uh, documents, the decks uh, to be available in Japanese. So uh, we will look at again, having a series of these webinars. We would like to receive your feedback. Uh, there are upcoming events that you can check on our website. So thank you everyone, stay safe and have a great evening. Arigato.